Good evening. I'll call the meeting of the Johnson County Community College trustees for February to order. Please help me open the meeting with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, the next item, I guess before we go on, I was, I'm going to announce now that at the end of the meeting we do have about an hour, we we're going to ask for an hour executive session on two topics, so um, that won't affect the rest of you, but I wanted to make sure the trustees knew already that their evening was going to be prolonged. Uh, the next item is roll call and recognition of visitors. This evening's visitors include Dick Carter and Roberta Eveslage. The next item on the agenda is the open forum. The open forum is a portion of the board agenda, uh, a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled uh, board of trustee meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of uh, people plan to speak. Tonight we have three people signed up, so each will get five minutes. Uh, in order to be recognized, the individuals must register at the door. Uh, individuals. Uh, are expected to be respectful and civil and should not address matters of personnel. Matters with the college, as a practice, uh, we do not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggestion processes or otherwise the subject of review by the college or the board. Uh, as I said, we have three people signed up uh, this evening. The first one is Tope Seya Jawi. Yes, sir. Come on, Tope, up to the podium and if you want to say your name correctly, that would be awesome as well. I know you're a student here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as the president, uh, Greg Milsel said, my name is Tope Sei Ajayi is the correct pronunciation. Thank you very much. And I will not take too much of your time this evening. Um, I only want to speak briefly about an issue that's been brought to my attention. Uh, like I said, my name is Tope Sayyid Ajayi, and I am here as an advocate on behalf of the Muslim student population we have on campus, and how we as an institution can better our so offer our support to um, our Muslim students. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Sajik for the email that you sent to the students, uh, showing our support as an institution, and emphasizing how much we support and care for our students. I believe we could go a step further in showing that we care for our students by turning those words into action. Here at JCCC, we have a total of 16,931 enrolled students as of 2017 spring uh, semester. Out of those 16,931, 1,378 are international students, uh, students with visa and um, which makes up 8% of the institution's headcount of students on campus. I have taken the liberty of acquiring some of the statistic sheets that show the population of students by country we have on campus, and they are as follows. And just to be time efficient, I'm only gonna name the top five with the highest population on campus, so that way I don't read off the whole sheet. Uh, we have 28 students from Algeria, 36 students from Iran, 61 students from India, 13 students from Saudi Arabia, and 19 students from Pakistan. Hmm. With such a high population, I believe that these students, we, they deserve our efforts because of the situation that we're forced to face with in America. Everyone's familiar with the, uh, our president currently banning um, the uh, I guess migration and, and traveling to, uh, to and from nine countries. I'm not gonna go into details or specific details about that, that's an issue above my head. But what I am gonna go into further detail on the topic is how we could support our fellow students and I have a breakdown on how much uh, each student as an international um, student is paying on campus per credit hour. As an, as an international student, which I fall under the same category, I'm an international student myself, um, per credit hour, we are paying $220 in comparison to a Johnson County community um, resident who was only paying $93 per credit hour. With that being said, if they are committed to paying this much per credit hour and still showing effort that they wanna be here, I can only ask that we show effort 
into how much we show that we care about their safety and what they have to go through as Muslim students on our campus as well. I have attended uh, two of the MSA meetings. MSA stands for the Muslim Students Association. I have taken liberty to attend two of those meetings on campus here myself. And since the, hitch, since the issue has been brought up to my attention, and here are some of the suggestions that they were comfortable enough to share with me as a way of resol uh, resolving the issue at hand. The Islamic Center at Johnson, of Johnson County was said to have invited some FBI agents to come and further um, educate, I guess, the Muslim followers at the uh, Islamic Center of Johnson County. They educated them about the rights and laws of Muslims. And I feel like, or I believe, that if we could just have a guest speaker come on campus to further educate us, not only as students, but also as faculty members, about the rights and laws of Muslim, you know, it would make our relationship better as students and as an institution amongst one another. Uh, another thing that I would also, um, that they told me or related to me was that, uh, I don't know if this is gonna be possible in any way, shape or form, but they said if we can invite an imam to speak, an imam is just a, a Muslim leader that or a person in charge of like a Muslim gathering. That's what they are called. They are referred to as the Imam. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not gonna take too much of your time. Again, uh, I believe by combining our efforts as much as, as well as our ideas, we can successfully show our students on campus the love and support that they need. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you, Tope. No problem. I, I think the faculty association's statement of principles that what they read that I think Dennis presented two meetings ago uh, captured some of those same feelings about inclusiveness and tolerance and the benefit of diversity and I hope that we continue to make people of all face, all colors, all genders, everything welcome on this campus. And I, I'm sure the people here in the administration have listened to what you had to say today and we'll work with you to try to make that a reality. Thank you so much. Thank sir. you. I can only ask that you guys show your support collectively as an individual and as a whole group. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, guys. Appreciate, Appreciate you standing up today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. Uh, following that, David Krug. David Krug is a faculty member here. Come on up, Dave. Hello, my name is David Krug, and I am a professor of accounting here. And um, I wanted to take just this opportunity real quickly uh, just to spend a couple minutes talking about a, a wonderful event going on uh, right now on campus. And that is the, um, the BizFest that's over at the Rainier Center. And I know some of you have been able to drop by. Uh, this is my first year involvement with BizFest. I actually kind of found out about it by accident last year. I was walking around uh, campus and I saw about uh, six or seven students dressed up very nicely. and. I could tell they were practicing for a presentation, and so I asked them, you know, what was going on? And, and they talked to me about uh, BizFest. They were Latino students, and they said they were getting ready to present. And I was like, I've been here professor for 12 years. How come I didn't know about this? And so um, I talked to uh, Melissa Jimenez, and I talked with Henry, and wanted to get involved with that, and was able to present uh, regards, in regards to finance and accounting this morning. And first of all, I really want to thank, I know she's not here, but Melissa Jimenez is a recruitment coordinator, and she has worked very, very hard on this event. We probably have, oh, what, what is it, 150 to 200 uh, students from the community. They're not all Latino students, primarily Latino right. students. And um, we have been, we were, Saturday we had our orientation. That It started yesterday. I was able to present today. And it's just a tremendous opportunity. And I want to thank the campus for hosting this. This is exactly the sort of thing that gets, uh, gets my, my juices going. I just love it. I mean, I'm talking to these students, and they, they're working on business plans, and they are so eager to learn new things. And they're, they're, they're asking questions, and they're taking notes. And uh, I can just see the drive in their eyes. And, I had a number of students today I talked to after the presentation said, you know, I've never been on a college campus before. And, you know, and they, in, the, in their words, she, she said, uh, I could see myself going to school here. And it is a tremendous, tremendous thing that they have going over there. And I want to uh, make sure we keep it 
at JCCC, because I've already, already heard through the grapevine that uh, MCC and KCKCC is trying to get it over to their campus. And I want to do whatever we can to keep it, because this is just exactly the, uh, a group that we would love to have on campus. I know uh, in my former life, before I was a, uh, a professor here, I, uh, I was a recruiter, a headhunter. I had my own company for 10 years. And I worked with Chiquita International, and I was able to talk with these students as far as if you are a bilingual accountant. I, my, one of my specialties was, was recruiting bilingual accountants, Hispanic-speaking, uh, English-speaking accountants and CPAs. And um, it is a tremendous competitive advantage. And uh, I was able to talk with them about the associate's degree program at JCCC. And I've already, uh, already been lined up with, with to talk with uh, some of these students as far as what we can offer here at the campus. So I want to thank the campus. I know, Joe, you worked with it too. Um, I, I especially want to thank Henry, though, because I'm going to tell you, Henry is a business leader. Uh, and he was able to talk about his background as a Latino with these students, uh, about his journey, about where he came from, where he is now. And that is, that is inspiring to these kids. I, I'm, I'm very excited to have Henry as a trustee because I can see that he has a passion for this college. He has a passion for young people. And he especially has a passion for young Latino students. And that was very, very apparent in his work uh, over there with BizFest. So um, as a faculty, I want to I really thank you for, for your efforts. I can tell you really, really care about uh, those young people. So um, thank you for all your efforts in regards to BizFest. And let, I really want to keep it here on campus. Let's not let it go. Uh, Dave, last year was the first year we hosted it. So that's why you didn't hear about it the previous yeah. 11 years. Um, and I, I, like you, I'm very glad it was there. I had the opportunity to, to welcome the group last year. And the sponsors. Several of them came up and said, these, these kids have never been on a college campus before. They've never thought about college, some of them. They've never had the opportunity, and we want to give them that. And if, if it's an MCCC or KCKCC, that'd be fine, but I'd love to keep hosting them here. There's a graduation ceremony on Saturday, I understand. Do you know what time? Uh, know what it's, time? That's on my agenda. I don't know. It's a pretty full day. One o'clock. Is it one o'clock in Rainier? <coughs> yeah. yeah. So if anybody wanted to attend and uh, see some inspiration and maybe get our juices flowing, so that's what we try to do for you, Dave. And it's all day tomorrow as well. I see some faculty uh, right. here. If you have a chance tomorrow, drop by Rainier Center. And uh, it's in the big room down there. And it's just, it's just a tremendous event. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, Trustee Sandate, for your work on that. You're best. Yes, thank you. Okay. Lori Paldino. Hi, Lori. I debuted last month and you weren't here. I apologize. <laughs> well, this is round two. Um, reading less, fewer notes. I'm going to go off the cuff a little bit. Uh, my name is Lori Paldino. I am the Vice President of the Faculty Senate and an adjunct English and Business Communications Professor. And uh, I just wanted to update you on some of the things that the Senate is working on. We had. Uh, they, are, they still might be there. As a matter of fact, we had a very busy meeting today starting at 3 o'clock. Um, First on the agenda was uh, the process that we've started uh, after speaking with Dr. McLeod, uh, the adjunct committee is looking into adjunct facilitation. So you may or may not know that as adjuncts are brought on board, uh, either within the division or the department, someone is assigned to help them to um, on board, basically. Um, and we've heard here and there, you know, we thought that things were pretty consistent, but we've been hearing that things are not so consistent. So the question is, how does each division bring an adjunct on? And then uh, to further, is there an orientation type process? And is there ongoing facilitation? We know it happens in some areas. What is the process so that maybe we can suggest some consistent um, policies? Uh, the second thing that we are dealing with is online best practices. We've had lots of conversations and uh, different divisions have come up with lists of online best practices, but we're thinking that maybe there could be something a little more global that would uh, apply. Um, we had a conversation in the Senate about the difference between guidelines for online courses and best practices, and we're really looking at best practices. Some, what are some of the 
best things to make a, an online course as invigorating as possible, uh, which is always the challenge. We met with Sherry Barrett uh, for HLC accreditation. She gave us an update and um, we are going to be taking a look at the portfolio that she's put together. Um, as I'm sure you all are, it's sort of an eye, all eyes on process and so uh, as much feedback as she can get um, and she needs to cut some pages so maybe we'll have some suggestions for her. We met with HR, uh, Brian Scala came in and explained job postings because thankfully um, we have quite a few uh, full-time faculty positions that uh, are posted at the moment and um, sometimes the communication process uh, doesn't quite get down to the adjunct level and so the very people who are already teaching here on a part-time basis may be wanting full-time positions. So we've hopefully smoothed out that process. Um, it was posted on info list today. You may have seen the very long list of faculty positions and uh, Brian gave us a Twitter lesson on the fact that if we were following them on Twitter, we'd automatically get it because he posts things to LinkedIn and probably more than you need to know, but we're good um, and the communication has been improved. And then the last thing is College Now. Um, and we were updated on the process because HLC credentialing uh, was a bit delayed for College Now people. I think they were given five years as opposed to three. And uh, so they haven't had to commit to uh, gaining that extra 18 credit hours in their discipline until April of this year. So we're hoping to monitor that process and support our high school faculty. Um, we all have a vested interest in it. We found out today that 23% of enrollment comes from College Now courses. So it really would um, be in all of our best interest to make sure that those faculty are supported in gaining those credentials to continue teaching here. Thank you. Thank you. I'll report a little bit more on some adjunct discussions. We had a collegial steering that Doug Harvey may have shared with you and I'll share with the group. Uh, thank you, Lori. Our next item is uh, awards and recognitions. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Sobject. Thank you, Trustee Musil, and it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Korn. <laughs> okay. So I would like to ask uh, Tom Patterson if you would come to the, the podium, please. And I'm going to read this because I'm afraid I will leave out something really important if I don't read it. So Tom is being recognized um, by the Global and Multicultural Education Center for the 2017 Peace Builder Award. He is the Associate Professor and Director of International Education, and he has been selected by the Global and Multicultural Education as a recipient of this 2017 Peace Builder Award. The Global and Multicultural Education Center annually honors an individual and a grassroots organization that have demonstrated an outstanding performance in the area of global intercultural and interfaith understanding. The individual or organization chosen has shown a visionary commitment to the area of personal, social, political, economic, education, or environmental justice and a commitment to a more just and equal global society. Tom was selected because of his vision for and his leadership in the annual peace building conference and will be honored at a luncheon on January 21st. And he joins a long list of distinguished individuals who have received this award, including um, the Honorable Emmanuel Cleaver last year. Congratulations, Tom, and thank you. Uh, thank you, um, and um, I'm very honored by uh, GAME uh, for this award. And um, in return, I, I mean, I would like to thank all of you and, and JCCC for encouraging me and allowing me to do the kind of work that has resulted in this award. The, uh, uh, the annual peace building conference that we put on, we're gonna be putting on our fifth annual one this year, uh, which originated with a, United, uh, with a US Institute of Peace grant. The uh, State Department grant that we work on with Pakistan, uh, this is our second that we've been doing, work with um, the um, International Relations Council 
Uh, we did a series of talks on closing the global gap. And all of these are part of uh, the effort of bringing international intercultural under understanding, which leads to peace. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to do this work. Let's hear it. I'll share with you that we do things at our college that other colleges can't even, they, they can't even dream about. And it's because of the people who work here. Um, when, Tom gets, when Tom gets an award like this, um, naturally it's about him, but also it represents the efforts of so many people across campus who really contribute uh, incredible effort to pulling this together. So Tom, I just want to read the plaque real quick. In recognition of his peace building conferences and contributions to promote nonviolence, international understanding, and world peace. Uh, this is presented on behalf of the global and multicultural education. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you. I sense a theme to this meeting, and it's a pretty good one. Uh, congratulations, Tom. Thanks for continuing the recognition that this college has earned because of the work of people like you. And we have one more. Yes, uh, one more award. Yes. OK, so I would like to invite Debbie Eisenhower to the podium. Debbie is our coordinator in um, staff development, and she is going to um, talk to us about this award and who we get to recognize. Thank you, Judy. So Angie Sutherland, many of you know, uh, she's an associate professor and chair of Computer Sciences Information Services. She received the JCCC Leadership Institute 2016 Servant Leader Award. And I'll first tell you a little bit about the Servant Leader Award and then share with you uh, why Angie's colleagues nominated her for the award. Uh, Angie was selected among the 15 members of the cohort, and the award actually began uh, back in 2009 when the Leadership Institute cohort, uh, the first, first cohort, it's a word, it's a mouthful, graduated in 2008. Um, David Kennedy was a member of the cohort, and he died in 2009 unexpectedly. So the cohort asked, went to Karen Martley, I believe, and Judy Korb, and said we'd really like to honor David in a very special way. So since that time, we have been awarding a member of the graduating class who demonstrates service to the community, displays remarkable leadership within the Institute program, participates with thoughtful engagement, enthusiasm, and passion and positivity, and exemplifies a true servant leader. So Angie's colleagues applauded her for impacting the lives not only of our current students, but our future students. Angie puts in an additional consideration, time, and effort to her programs in her department. Um, as a Leadership Institute member, she um, exuberated positivity, energy. She's very thought-provoking, recognized as being kind, smart, and funny. As for demonstrating her work, Within our future, for our, excuse me, without, as for demonstrating her work with our future students, one needs only look to the Girls Who Code Club that Nash, that Angie brought to campus back in 2015. So the Girls Who Code Club, it's a national organization. She worked hard to bring it to JCCC and actually to Kansas City in 2015. The club was the first of its kind here in KC, and now there are three. The club is open to girls 6 to 12 years of age, with the mission being of teaching 1 million girls how to code by 2020 to fill technology industry jobs that will be opening up in the near future. Uh, Angie received her award at the luncheon, and so Angie, if you'll please come up. I'm sorry, I should have had you standing right next to me. <laughs> so this is the award that Angie received at the luncheon, and then her name will also be displayed, or is being displayed in GEB 264, which is where our Leadership Institute um, <coughs> sessions uh, twice a month meet. And in addition to Angie, some previous award winners, uh, 2009 was Gail Callahan, then Lindy Robinson, Judy Riley, Jim Lane, Phil Wegman, and now Angie. Congratulations.
Well, thank you so much, and I wanted to thank, um, first of all, the Leadership Institute is an amazing experience. If you haven't done it, I encourage you to uh, try it out. And I want to thank the college for continuing to fund that, because I learned so much in there and met so many other servant leaders um, from all over campus that I never would have met and engaged with, so it was a great experience. Uh, there are a lot of servant leaders on this campus. I work with them every day, so you could give away a lot of these awards, I can tell you. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank Deb Elder and Mike West, um, as my assistant dean and dean, because every time I come to them and I want to do something and there's a roadblock, if it is humanly possible, they remove the roadblock for me. So I really appreciate that. That has enabled me to do a lot of this. So thank you very much. Thank you and congratulations. <laughs>
not because of the activity at Washington, <laughs> D.C., but because of the plane ride. But uh, Donnie uh, was so gracious to attend uh, the summit with us. Uh, we visited uh, Senator Roberts, Senator Moran, and Congressman Yoder's office. And uh, Donnie was the key player in terms of explaining uh, the process he has gone through uh, post high school, seven years in the military, um, mixed experiences at universities, president of the Student Senate, is currently uh, pursuing a dual degree in physics and engineering. He uh, has started the PACE program on campus, which is a very special program for veterans. He's very active with the Student Senate, as you can tell, with the number of people lined up to be on the Student Senate. It always hasn't been that way. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to publicly thank you, Donnie, for uh, the outstanding ambassadorship you did for the college. Uh, as a result of that, uh, both senators and the congressmen are very supportive of not just Johnson Com Community College, of course, but community college efforts uh, in our state. And uh, we're very, very impressed with the young man you are and the great ambassador. So thank you very much. We really appreciated you attending. And Dr. Sopcich, you might have a word as well for that. But. <laughs> okay. Is there anything left? Is there anything left for me to say after that? No, Donnie was terrific. And when you visit with our representatives, our elected representatives, um, naturally the one person they want to talk to in the room, aside from Trustee Cook, is our student. And, uh, and that was Donnie, and he never lets us down. I mean, for those of you who are at Seven Channel in the evening, uh, he did a remarkable job presenting there, uh, and he continues that on. So he has quite the future as a public speaker, as well as whatever else may happen to you. So Donnie, thank you for your service and uh, for joining us on, on the trip to DC. It was a big success, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Cook, for pointing that out because Donnie is more than just a student here and more than just a student senate president. He is an ambassador uh, as far away as Washington, D.C., a very talented young man. Um, he will be followed by a talented young man, our uh, college lobbyist, Dick Carter. Can you get, tell us what's happening legislatively, please? I certainly can. I hope I get to be in the category of the inspirational start and not the boring plumbing uh, part of the meeting. It's yet to be seen. <laughs> Yes, it does. What is the reason? <laughs> this, this, this. Since we gathered last month, um, the good news is the budget revenues uh, receipts coming into the state are up 24 million uh, over expectations. Um, that is good news indeed. I would just remind you that in November, we did adjust what those expectations should look like. And so it should not be a surprise that um, we've had three months where um, we've actually met some of those revenue expectations. Uh, don't confuse a $24 million uptick with um, a problem being solved. We still have a current year uh, budget shortfall of around $325 million. Legislators are currently, this, this is what we've been doing for the past couple of weeks, the legislature is, is currently debating how to fill that hole uh, and how to generate additional revenue. And so I have a few updates uh, regarding that um, that are as, as recent as of four o'clock this afternoon. Uh, last Thursday, uh, the Senate was set to debate a budget and a tax plan that they'd been working on uh, in their respective uh, committees. And uh, they had set aside the entire day on Thursday to uh, hold those, those uh, conversations, that debate on the floor. Things blew up before the Senate ever even went in at 8 a.m. and uh, uh, I would say a day was wasted, at least as far as um, the legislature's work on the Senate side. Um, what they had planned to, to accomplish, they were not able to do uh, during that time frame. At that point, um, the Senate budget bill uh, cut K-12 education approximately 5%, cut higher education in the neighborhood of 3%. Uh, those numbers were uh, 128 million and 23 million, respectively. Um, they had delayed the, uh, the payment back to CAPERS, which was about $90 million, uh, swept some money from the Pooled Money Investment Board, which has been part of the governor's plan uh, to arrive at a, uh, a number that they could uh, at least make ends meet for this fiscal year, uh, the year that we're currently in. The tax plan that, that they had uh, passed out of tax committee um, eliminated or repealed the LLC pass-through income um, provisions that were passed in 2012, adjusted some of the individual 
uh, income tax rates in the two brackets that exist uh, today. And so the combination of those, uh, of those two items uh, essentially uh, got us out of the pickle that, that we're in in the current year. Uh, that didn't begin to address the, the problems that we have facing uh, in fiscal year 2018, and, and we'll get to that uh, at some point in the session. Uh, but there was a little bit of a, uh, like I said, a little bit of a kerfuffle uh, Thursday morning, and things just did not go as planned. Today, uh, the House ha had continued with the development of their uh, tax plan, and uh, the, the conversation was held on the, uh, on the House floor yesterday. It was not much of a conversation. Um, the tax plan in the House passed on a division vote of 83 to 39. I say that uh, because that is significant. Um, we no longer look at things in the House and Senate as merely 21 and 63. Um, 80, 84 votes are what it takes to override a veto, 28 in the Senate, uh, 84 in the House. And so the fact that on a division vote in the House, um, the tax plan passed with little conversation yesterday uh, with 83 votes is fairly significant. They um, went on to have final action today and, and seven or so um, peeled off. Uh, so the, the uh, House tax plan passed with a vote of final action vote of 76 to 48 uh, around noon today. That plan now goes over to the Senate where it's planned to be fast tracked. Uh, in fact, it, it will uh, not go through the normal committee process in the Senate. I think they're planning to bring it directly to the floor have that debate or that conversation on the Senate floor. Um, Senate President Wagle indicates that she believes the votes are there to pass the House tax plan. We'll see. We don't know if there will be further, um, further debate or further amendments. Certainly there will be some that challenge the fact that it didn't go through the committee process, but we've been subverting that for several years now, and so I'm not terribly concerned about that. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, it, it would be a significant shift in tax policy, certainly since 2012, and uh, the governor has indicated that he plans to, uh, to not sign it, um, whether or not uh, he allows it to become law without his signature or he, in fact, vetoes it, I think remains to be seen. Not a lot of difference in the, in the House tax plan. It still eliminates the, uh, the LLC pass-through. It adjusts the uh, individual income tax rates. It adds back in a third bracket that existed prior to 2012, uh, and there's some other tweaks in there as well. Um, that, that get them to where they think they need to be. <coughs> the, um, and, and so that, that's pretty much where we're at budget-wise as far as a rescission for the current year uh, is, as well as finding, uh, getting some revenue generated. A lot of that revenue doesn't show up until fiscal year 2018, and they need money now. So we'll see what happens tomorrow when the Senate decides to take up the, uh, the House's tax plan. And, um, and we'll see if they, they do, in fact, have the votes to pass it. Let me talk a little bit about some other issues that have been going on and, and some issues that we've been um, a part of. Um, there have been a number of bills uh, dealing with uh, guns on campuses or guns in public buildings. There are two bills that would seek to extend the exemption um, for college campuses and or other public buildings. Uh, there are two bills out there that would provide immunity to um, employers uh, in the public uh, arena who have employees that may choose to, uh, to carry even though their job does not require them to do so. Uh, it would provide immunity to, the, to those employers. There's a general cleanup bill um, through the Attorney General's office. I did not include that in the report. Um, it's, I, I, I think it's rather um, non-controversial. However, I think they're going to wait to work that till the very end of the session because any, any bill is amendment um, bait is what we would call it in, on the House or Senate floor, and I think those are some of the concerns that the various folks in leadership have. Uh, there's one other bill out there um, that was defeated yesterday uh, in, in committee, and that was a bill that spoke specifically to uh, guns at, K, at the KU Hospital Authority or at the um, University um, Medical Center. And that bill um, is stuck in committee. Um, it was on a tie vote. That essentially kills the bill for now. Um, there's, there's all kinds of rules. You can always bring something back. I think we'll have the conversation later on in the session again uh, about guns on campus. It's an issue that's not going to go away, but there is not the will to pass those bills on to the uh, to the floor for further debate at this point. 
Uh, JCCC did submit a statement uh, via trustee uh, Musil, as well as uh, we had representatives from the faculty association that appeared um, before the committee in the Senate. There was a communication error in the House. Uh, however, their statement was included in the, uh, in, for the record. And, uh, and they may talk about that in, in the faculty association report a little bit later. Um, there may be some further conversations about that that, that, um, that occur later on in the, uh, in the uh, meeting today, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, here in just a minute uh, or whenever, whenever you want. Uh, there are, continues to be discussions about working after retirement and CAPERS. There's lots of subcommittee meetings that are going on and, and legislators are trying to get their mind about around how that that looks and how that works, and we continue to follow that. Um, while uh, Dr. Cook, Dr. Sopchik, and I, uh, along with Kate Allen and Donnie Witten, were in um, Washington, D.C. this this past week, uh, the House uh, Committee um, visited uh, the issue of due process again for K-12 teachers. We'll see what happens there. I, I don't know that the, uh, from what I uh, read and from what I picked up from some of my colleagues, I don't know that the conversation went well uh, by the way, the uh, committee leadership administered uh, uh, the hearing. At least that's, that's what I'm picking up in, in some of those various accounts that have been in, pre in print. Um, the chairman has indicated that uh, he desires to work out a compromise with all parties, and so we'll see if that, that takes place next week. Just some other education matters that, uh, that are out there related to higher education. The Senate Education uh, Committee, under the leadership of Senator Baumgartner, uh, has held a series of informational meetings on a, on a host of topics that I think we're going to probably see some bills um, about later, either later on uh, or certainly into the future. And those, those issues uh, relate to uh, remediation, um, tuition um, or tuition deals that might be out there with different community colleges. Talked a little bit about service areas. Uh, and, and so we'll see what, what comes of those conversations, uh, but, but have had a, um, a nice round of, of informational hearings to bring folks up to speed, uh, at least on her committee, about what's going on in the world of higher education, and, and specifically in the community college and, and technical college areas. Uh, I think it's important to uh, uh, call your attention to um, an addition uh, to uh, the uh, the staff, uh, either through KACCT or, or through uh, Divine and Donnelly, the, the lobbyist firm that uh, helps out KACCT, uh, Dr. Vietti, Jackie Vietti, who retired from Butler uh, College, Butler Community College, has um, temporarily joined their staff just to offer some expertise and some analysis on various um, higher education related issues. The um, Post-secondary uh, technical uh, education authority was approved today in the House, 124 to zero. Um, that bill was on the consent calendar, which means there was no opposition. Uh, it sat there for three days and was approved 124 to zero, as was uh, a bill um, that would add a trustee member at, at Cali Community College. Um, just, just to kind of bring you up to speed on, on that issue, Cali has, um, been granted taxing authority uh, in another county, I believe it's Sumner, uh, and they desire to build a building there. And, uh, and so in doing so, they wanted to add a representative from that area that is being taxed onto their, onto their board. Um, that bill uh, passed in the House uh, 124 to zero. Interestingly, there is a mirror bill in the Senate, Senate Bill 75, which was passed out of committee and placed on the consent calendar it was later pulled off the consent calendar and, and it sits on general orders awaiting action in the House. So, so that issue is not complete or it's not done. Uh, I'm not sure what the issue may be there, um, but I think folks just kind of wanted to sit back and, and take a look. And then finally, um, we did have a very successful trip uh, to Washington, D.C. Um, the, the conversations always go very well when we're in the delegate's office. Um, we have the fortune of uh, almost always being able to meet with the elected delegate. Um, we had one that had to run to the Senate floor for, for a vote, but did take the time to greet us and, and um, just have a brief conversation before we got into the details of, of the business. But I can tell you that the staff in those offices are dedicated um, to their work. They do a good job. They're engaged on our issues and on our topics. And they, can, they remember um, from year to year the things that we bring to them uh, and, and talk about. And so I think there's going to be some distinct opportunities in the future um, with the way um, both Congress and the Senate are moving along with some of the, uh, the possible 
um, opportunities that may be coming down from the administration. So we'll, we'll keep our, our eyes and ears open on that. But I was very encouraged um, this, this particular trip, maybe more than in the past, um, with, with some of the conversations that we had with those folks. We also, uh, again, hosted on behalf, or, or coordinated rather, um, along with, uh, hosted with the 19 community colleges in Kansas, a reception for the delegates and staff. A little bit difficult to do when it's Valentine's Day, um, but we did see some love from some of the staffers and from some of the, the young people that work in those offices, and it was really um, a great atmosphere to continue building those, those relationships, and, and we'll be happy to do that if, if asked uh, to do so again. So what's next? Uh, next Friday, uh, a week from tomorrow, is the first turnaround deadline. Uh, I do think that we will have a rescission bill uh, along with a tax package that comes out. I don't know what it will look like. I do not think it will look like what passed the House today. Uh, and it may not look like what uh, comes out of the Senate tomorrow. Uh, but we will have those uh, completed most likely by the 24th. Folks are going to take off uh, about a week or so and bank some of that time to add on at the end of the, of the session. And uh, they'll be back on March 6th, Monday, March 6th. Uh, to start sort of the, the second round of, of the uh, legislative session. And so just to remind you, uh, the way that works is all bills are supposed to uh, be out of the, the house of origin that they started in. We're hearing that there's not going to be a lot of blessing of the bills. Uh, it's the term used to keep a bill alive if it hasn't met the, uh, uh, the criteria for moving from one house to the other. So let me stop there, Mr. Chairman, and see if there's uh, any questions that I thought Coach Cook might have a question. Apparently, Trustee Cook and... Trustee Cross and I and others have questions. Jerry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Did I understand that the Senate will uh, address the House bill tomorrow, or is it just going over to the Senate tomorrow? Well, it's making its way over to the Senate. Uh, it, should be on, it should be there now, and they will be addressing it tomorrow thank on you. the floor. Thank you. That's the plan. Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there any news or any discussion at all about due process for community college professors? Uh, no, I've not heard any. Um, I figure that may be a first step uh, bill with uh, the bill that was, was heard this week. Um, and, uh, and I don't think it will be addressed before turnaround. It may be one of those bills that, in fact, does get blessed uh, or is dealt with later on at the end of the session, but I've not heard anything to, to that tune yet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to clarify that question. It's a good question. Uh, due process for community college professors was a topic last year in the legislature. Uh, it is still state statute that provides a due process protection for professors. We also have it in our master agreement. So it's not, it was not adding something to the state statute. It was removing it last year. And we, um, at, frankly, I think have a better process in our master agreement if the state were to take some action to remove it. But, um, I guess my only comments, as usual, would be I have to comment that I'm not impressed with meeting expectations when we have lowered them probably a dozen times in the last four years. Eventually, you will meet your expectations. Uh, we don't do that here at the college for our students. We don't do it for our faculty. We don't do it for our staff to say, oh, we, made our, we met our expectations. We only wanted a 5% drop in students, and we were able to convince 5% of the students not to come back. Um, so that's not impressive in the structural thing. What, what I'm hoping that we see, and I think everybody should see, nobody likes more taxes, but if we don't get a structural fix so that we're not continually borrowing money from whatever we have left in funds or borrowing future income streams from the tobacco uh, securitization or otherwise, we don't have a budget. We are borrowing money. That $317 million in the pooled money investment board, the governor wanted to borrow 300 of it. So what do you do next year? You got 17 million left. He wanted to sweep KDOT again, Department of Transportation funds. Uh, he wanted to not pay CAPERS, retirement for public employees. We have to get a structural budget in Kansas, and I think the people on this board, when we talk to our representatives, uh, explain that to them, and hopefully there will be a majority in Topeka, a majority or a supermajority if necessary to override a veto that will say Kansas ought to be able to pay its bills in the future. So thank you for your efforts up there. I know every day is a new day, and. Things change quickly, and we appreciate uh, having you up there. And Kate, your work up there as well with Dr. Sopcich. Any other questions or comments? I Trustee Ingram? One, yes. And it was just really a clarification of something that you said about the Senate Education Committee that Matt, and you referred to tuition deals. What, what does that mean? Uh, one, of the, one of the conversations that has come up is the, the 
Dr. Sopcich, you may have to jump in here a little bit. Um, the value uh, of the education that you're receiving, the price that another college may be offering either in district or out of district, or deals that they may be um, developing between uh, in intra or inter-institution. And so you may have some, some uh, four-year institutions offering a reduced or free type uh, tuition uh, incentive uh, for students. Is that fairly accurate? Did I? It is. Um, you know, what's going on is incredible competition for enrollment. Right. I mean, that's across the country, really, but definitely in this state. So it kind of uh, got started when I think Wichita State um, started doing um, uh, concurrent, and concurrent classes um, for $100 a credit hour, which is considerably lower than what they would normally charge. Um, well, excuse me, $100, $100 a course or $33 a credit hour. So now what you have is a Walmart effect where its prices are being knocked down. Another community college sent a flyer up here to our school districts offering $49.99 uh, concurrent. So it's kind of insane. Wichita State um, is offering in-state tuition to students on the Missouri side in Kansas City. Um, it's, it's kind of fascinating to see exactly what's going on these days. So um, that's what uh, Dick was alluding to, and I think it's important that the legislature at least has an idea that this is going on, um, because um, if we continue to devalue our product in a dollars and cents way, then I think the legislature will say, well, if you can do it for $33 a credit hour, some schools, by the way, are giving away the concurrent for free, um, then why should the state reimburse you at whatever rate you're charging? Um, so we do not do that here. Um, you know, we're at $93 a credit hour and that's it. So it's really kind of a fascinating thing. The other thing we don't do here, you know, we, well, we also have increments that will increase tuition with regards to out of state, out of county, um, you know, out of country. Um, not all schools do that. You know, not all schools do that. And when it comes to competing on the, on the tuition, then it puts us at a disadvantage. Uh, but we're not going to make a recommendation where we uh, uh, go to the lowest bar possible, which is, seems to be happening at a lot of institutions. Okay. And although Trustee Sharp is not here, I know she would remind everyone to stay in touch with your members of the legislature throughout this session as well. So don't give up. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Appreciate your work in Washington, too, coordinating that effort. Uh, the next item on the agenda is committee reports and recommendations. The first one is the Audit Committee. Uh, Trustee Sharp and I sit on that committee. We met on February 9th at 8 a.m. Uh, we re received the audit staff's uh, review of the bian biannual travel and expense review <coughs> where they look at 100% of all trustee travel and 100% of all uh, cabinet level employee travel to ensure that it complies with appropriate reimbursement policies and all of it did. Uh, we got quarterly project and they also do a random sample of travel expenses for faculty, other faculty and staff, and all of those showed that people were following appropriate policies. We received some quarterly project updates, uh, including an audit of the Johnson County Community College Foundation that's ongoing, and the Employee Benefits uh, uh, Department of the college. And there will be an upcoming outsourced privileged identity and access management audit uh, to see who has access to various computer uh, databases and software databases on the college. Uh, we always get a uh, follow-up uh, matrix on recommendations made in prior audits to see that they are actually being implemented and they just weren't talked about. We received a report on the Johns County Community College Ethics Report Line, which is our ability to report either anonymously or by identifiable reporter uh, issues on campus, uh, whether it's simply odd behavior or it's believed to be sexual harassment or employee discrimination, theft, or those types of things. Uh, that is always followed by a report on a behavioral intervention team, uh, specifically looking particularly at students but employees about things that are going on where we could use some intervention to assist them in facilitating uh, their education. And we received an executive briefing on the hospitality and culinary fiscal review. Uh, our next meeting is May 11, 2017. That meeting will be held at 8.30 a.m. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If not, the next report is collegial steering. That is also Trustee Sharp as vice chair and myself as chair. Uh, uh, Professor Paldino in her report uh, during open forum talked about some adjunct issues and I understand uh, prefaced those last month when I was, was absent. We spent the meeting this past, a week ago Tuesday, 
Uh, also talking about adjunct issues brought up by Doug Harvey, who's on the uh, Collegial Steering Committee as an adjunct. And I guess I'll say for people viewing, an adjunct is a part-time professor uh, paid by credit hour, not a full-time employee, as our other full-time faculty members are. Uh, so they have some different issues and some different uh, integration and coordination issues. They may teach at multiple colleges with different types of reporting requirements, different types of databases, grading, syllabus, other things, and it does become an issue of coordination. We talked about a number of issues, some of which are uh, easier to handle than others, some of which are very intractable, not, not necessarily intractable, but uh, include significant budget issues uh, with respect to compensation and benefits, uh, but are nonetheless issues that deserve continued discussion, uh, and I think we'll probably maybe continue some of that discussion as the efforts that Lori talked about for things like an adjunct handbook and more coordination and best practices continue across the campus, but it was a good discussion. Um, you want questions about collegial steering? If not, we'll move to the next item, which is human resources. Trustee Ingram has been working nonstop on her report. Thank you. The Human Resources Committee met on February 6, 2017. Matt Wheeler and Michelle Oldy from Holmes Murphy and Associates presented detailed information regarding the medical plan renewal proposal from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City. The college has experienced good performance in the medical plan over the last year, and after negotiations by Holmes Murphy, the aggregate increase for Johnson County Community College medical premiums will be 3.8%. The premium increase percentage on plans offered will vary slightly based on the actual cost increase to specific plans. The committee reviewed and is prepared to make rec recommendation on several 2017-2018 benefit plan and administration contract renewals. Chair Musil, I can provide a brief summary of each renewal if you would like to consider all of them as one recommendation this evening. We have multiple recommendations. Is there anybody that would like to pull one of those and consider it separately? Or are you comfortable with Trustee Ingram summarizing them and we'll, we'll approve them in one motion? Okay. I would I would uh, have one motion if we could. Okay, let's do it that way. Certainly. Um, Cigna Dental, um, well, excuse me, all of the following renewals are for plan year 2017-2018 in the full description in the board packet includes a breakdown of plan cost as appropriate. Each renewal is, uh, is an annual renewal for a longer term agreement. The first is Cigna Dental. It's a final renewal and a three-year agreement reflecting a 0% increase in an annual fees. Delta Dental, final renewal in a three-year agreement with a 3% increase in annual fees. VSP, which is Vision, final renewal in a two-year agreement with 0% increase in annual fees. Standard Life Insurance is a third renewal in a five-year agreement with zero increase in annual fees. Standard Life Insurance, short-term disability insurance is a third renewal in a five-year agreement. This includes a 25% increase in annual fees. This increase is justified based on plan performance and takes our rate back to the annual fee prior to the current agreement. Holmes Murphy and Associates Benefit Consulting is a third renewal in a five-year agreement, 0% increase in annual fees. ASI Flex is our Flex Spending Account Administration, which is a final renewal in a three-year agreement with 0% increase in annual fees. ComPsych Guidance Resources Employee Assistance Program is third renewal in a five-year agreement. Again, 0% increase in annual fees. Flex Benefit Funding remains at $1,108.94 per month. Employer 403B contribution is 7% for benefit eligible employees prior to June 1, 2014, and 8% for benefit eligible employees after June 1, 2014 and that reflects a 0% increase. Blue Cross Blue Shield, Kansas City, final renewal in a two-year agreement, 3.8% increase in aggregate annual premium, as I mentioned earlier. It is the recommendation of the Human Resources Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the college administration's recommendation <clears throat> to authorize the president to renew contracts subject to review by college counsel for the provision of the benefit plans and administration as listed as numbers one through 10 in the board packet on pages one through five, and I so move. Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the seven benefit plans for plan year 2017. 
which affect all of the employees here. And I just confirmed I, our operating budget, about 79% of our operating budget is people. Um, these benefit costs are a big part of that. I think overall the percentage increases indicate that, that our staff and Holmes Roberts did a, a good job of negotiations again. So is there any further discussion on that motion? If not all in favor, say, uh, say yes. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries <clears throat> six to zero. The Human Resources Committee is also bringing forward a recommendation for an investment advisor to provide investment consulting on Johnson County Community College's 403B plan. An RFP was issued and six firms responded. A committee reviewed the proposals and asked two companies to give presentations. After considerable, careful consideration, Two West was selected for a recommendation. This is a recommendation of the Human Resources Committee but was noted as the management committee in the board packet, so I want to provide that correction for us this evening. <coughs> that being said, it is the recommendation of the Human Resources Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the proposal from Two West for an annual contract for investment consulting services in an amount not to exceed $40,000, and I so move. Second. Been moved and seconded to accept the recommendation for Two West as the investment consulting services. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor say yes. Yes. Uh, opposed no. Motion carries 6-0. That does conclude my report. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. That's a lot of hard work to go through those for the committee. Uh, and I appreciate your doing that at the committee level and uh, helping us facilitate it here. But those are important, important to everybody that works on this campus. So thank you. Uh, learning quality, Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You were missed. Mainly your sense of humor, not so much you. <laughs> Mr. Chair, the Learning Quality Committee met on February 6, 2016 at 8 a.m. in this room. Uh, trustees uh, Sandate, Ingram, and myself were present, along with a host of other people. Uh, Mike West, Emily Behrman, Tom Patterson, Judy Corb, Mark Van Corp, and Debbie Rulo all gave presentations, summaries of which can be found in the board packet on pages 8 through 12. Uh, the Learning Quality Committee, Mr. Chair, will meet again on March 6th. I'd stand for any questions, and that concludes my report. And I sure hope you know I was kidding. I, I agree. Uh, Except, you have a recommendation. Oh, well, we do, we do. Mr. Chairman, I apologize. Uh, it is the recommendation of the Learning Quality uh, Committee, Mr. Chair, that the Board of Trustees accepts the administration's recommendation to allow contract negotiations for groups to perform at the Carlson Center during the 2017-18 academic year, as shown below in your board packet at page 9, which is a confidential list, so uh, I'm pretty um, stern about confidentiality, as you know. So I'm not going to read that list, but it's, it's a fascinating list and an awesome list. I didn't mean to skip over it. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. I so move. Second. Been moved and seconded that we authorize uh, the college to contract for the groups listed in the, in the board packet to perform in the Carlson Center <coughs> during the 2017-2018 uh, academic year. Is there any discussion? Not all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries six to zero. Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. The next meeting will be on March 6th. Thank you. Management Committee, Dr. Cook. Thank you, uh, Trustee Chair. As I was uh, studying best practices and management strategies out of the country, I was not in attendance, so I'll defer to Trustee Lindstrom. Thank you, Trustee Cook. It was my honor uh, to chair the meeting of the Management Committee. It was the audience's chagrin, however. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the Management Committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, February 1st, here in the boardroom, uh, the information related to the management meeting begins on page 13 and runs through 26 of the board packet. Uh, the management committee received several reports from staff. Uh, we, we, we began with a presentation from Emily Behrman, general manager of the Performing Arts Center. Is Emily here today? I don't see her. Um, Emily reported on the college, uh, po college's performing arts programming she gave a financial report and an overview of expenses and income, and she presented highlights from uh, the recent renovations uh, completed at the Carlson Center. Emily made a note of uh, that the private dollars that have been supported 
uh, that had been donated uh, to support refurbishments, including a donation uh, for upgraded sound systems in the Polsky Theater, a new Steinway concert piano, a grand piano, uh, hand railings for the terrace seating at Yardley Auditorium, and take a seat campaign to provide <coughs> support for performing arts programming by naming a seat in Yardley Auditorium. Uh, and um, to date, there are 48 of those uh, seats have been sold. Emily, uh, and, and, and I think it's important that the board know that Emily <laughs> thanked the Board of Trustees for its support of uh, the renovations project over there. Uh, John Clayton, uh, Executive Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Planning and Research, uh, reported on two agreements with outside agencies. These agreements uh, can be found in the consent agenda if you have uh, an interest in those. And Rachel Lurch, uh, Lurch uh, Chief Financial Officer of the college, uh, she reported on uh, the budget development continues through the 2017-18 year, fiscal year, and she provided a detailed progress report. Uh, she mentioned that a detailed progress report will be made to the management committee on April 5th in advance of the annual budget workshop, which will be held during the board meeting on here at April 20th. Rex Hayes, Associate uh, Vice President for Campus Services and Planning, <coughs> Facility Planning, um, provided a monthly update on capital infrastructure projects and this report can be found on page 24 of today's packet. And uh, we have uh, two uh, recommendations to present to the full board this evening. The first is um, a recommendation was to change policies in the accounting and auditing section of the college's policy library, which have been reviewed as part of a broader assessment of the college's finance uh, uh, policies and procedures. These policies uh, changes begin on page 14 in the board packet. And I have a recommendation, Mr. Chairman, to make on that. And it is the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to one, approve deletion of debt funding refinancing policy 210-08A and the unencumbered uh, balance policy 210-10 and two, uh, and secondly, approve modification to the following policies. Accounting system 210.01, capital funding 210.09, cash reserves 210.07, debt service 210.08, a designation of banks and disbursement authority 210.04, and my monthly reports 210.03, it is, as is, it is shown subsequently in the board packet, that's a lot of two tens, and uh, I'll, I'll make that motion. Second. Been moved and seconded to accept the recommendation of the management committee and the administration to revise the policies <laughs> identified. Is there any discussion? Not all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Chairman, uh, our final recommendation is for a bid for the construction manager at risk services for career and technical education and arts building and related renovations. And uh, it would be the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept recommendations on the college administration to approve the proposal from J.E. Dunn Construction for the construction manager at risk for career and technical education and arts building and related renovations to include pre-construction services in the amount of $79,500 and construction and management services at the rate of 1.50% and the general condition cost at the rate of 3.56% of the actual project guaranteed maximum price or GMP construction cost with the final agreement subject to separate board approval of bond issuance and receipt of sufficient bond revenue to fund the project, as well as review by the College Council, and I'll make that motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the uh, recommendation to contract with J.E. Dunn Construction as the construction manager at risk. I guess I'll note that it was a low bid. There were 57 companies notified, five responded. 
Um, is there any discussion? Yes, I have, yes. I have a further comment. Uh, n not only was it the low bid cumulatively, there were three sections of the bid that I noted there, and J.E. Dunn was the lowest in all three of those uh, se separate uh, sections. Yeah. Great, thank you. All in favor say yes. Yes. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries 6-0. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. We are, we've finished the committee reports, and we're ready for the President's recommendations for action. The first item is the Treasurer's report, which would be Trustee Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Treasurer's uh, report for this month is contained in the board packet, uh, and it is for the month ending December 31st, 2016. Some items of note include, at page one of the Treasurer's report, is the general post-secondary technical education fund summary as of December 31st. 50% of the college's fiscal year has expired. The college's unencumbered ba cash balance as of December 31st, 2016 in all funds was $55.3 million. State aid payments of $10.3 million were received in January and will be <coughs> reflected in next month's report. An ad valorem tax distribution of $50.1 million was received from the county in January and will be reflected in next month's report. Expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits, and it is therefore the recommendation of the college administration, Mr. Chair, that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's report for the month ended December 31st, 2016, subject to audit. And I so move. Second. Moved and seconded to accept the Treasurer's report subject to audit. Are there any questions for the Treasurer or staff? Not all in favor say yes. 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 No. Motion carries six to zero. Thank you, Lee. Dr. Sopcic. Thank you, Trustee Musil. Um, I hope you take the time <clears throat> to review the February monthly report uh, to the board. A lot of great information in there from across all the departments on campus. Um, this edition is, is excellent, by the way. I think you'll really appreciate it. We even have some color photography in here as well. Um, I just want to talk about a few things very quickly. Um, first of all, enrollment. Um, we. Um, are doing, Jerry and I were in a, in a cab line talking to another community college president. Um, they're down 10% this semester. And across the country, as we talked about earlier, schools are really scrambling for enrollment. Um, we can celebrate here that this, we've had two consecutive semesters of, of enrollment growth. So yeah, it's very impressive. Um, our fall to fall, if you look at last fall, we were up 0.3 uh, of 1%. It's still a win. Um, with our headcount. In the spring, we've been up 1.7% versus a year ago. So that's outstanding. Um, it's really reflective of a lot of great work done by our uh, student services area, our admissions team, counseling. Um, it, it's, it was just an outstanding wrap up uh, for, for this semester. I also want to note that a little more than a year ago, I think you all approved the metro rate. And it's something that we hadn't done before. Um, from last spring to this spring, our metro rate uh, enrollment's up 31.3%. at totals 863 students. So that's outstanding, bringing those students from Kansas to Missouri. Um, How about Missouri to Kansas? From Missouri, Missouri to Kansas, yeah. thank you. Um, I, should take the, I should take a class. Um, <laughs> there you go. That gave you great joy, didn't it? Yeah. Um, but you know, tonight you heard um, Dave Krug. <laughs> tonight you heard Dave Krug talk about BizFest and the enthusiasm and the excitement he's had about that program. I hope you all get a chance to go to the one o'clock uh, ceremony on Saturday. It's really, it's really wonderful. Um, Angie Sunderland was up here talking about um, her her program and the award she received. And I've sat through her capstone class. In fact, I brought a couple of those students here. Um, I think a year ago, um, and with Angie's support, they shared with you the projects that they're doing with the local community as far as helping them with some of their software needs. Lori was up here earlier, Lori Paldino. She's done, I watched her in action at a, one of our um, adjunct orientations, and she was working with the other adjuncts, trying to get them, share with them some of the more uh, state-of-the-art online classes. Later on, you're gonna hear Dennis Arjo speak. I mean, Dennis will do an incredible job, um, kind of makes everyone want to take a class in philosophy. Um, I heard Melanie Harvey speak at the Capitol. And the reason I'm saying this is that um, wouldn't all of you love to take a class from any one of these instructors here? 
I mean, what incredible representation that we have that goes on inside the classroom. And I think when we talk about all these growth in numbers, it's so many things that happen across campus, but what happens in that classroom is ultimately uh, the biggest deal that we have. And when you look at those profs that we've had up here tonight, um, that's so indicative of the quality that we have at Johnson County Community College. A few other points. Um, I'd like to share with you an accomplishment of our nursing program. Um, RegisteredNursing.org uh, rated all the nursing programs in Kansas. And um, our nursing program, and this is a great accomplishment for us, our nursing program came in number four in the state and number one versus all the community colleges. I know you want to know who one through three is. Um, two of those were, were uh, technical schools and the other one was Newman. And so, um, hats off to Karen LaMartina and her team for making this happen. The criteria um, were how well a program, um, how our students are directed and helped through their pursuit of licensure uh, and beyond, and also our pass rate. And I think it's the NCLEX, is that the proper way? NCLEX. And what's our rate, Mickey? What's our pass rate uh, on that? Currently, we are 98.3. Yeah, and is that, is that typical for nursing programs? No, most, pe most places um, that top 90 is, is pretty good. There are a few that are in the 80s. So that gives you some idea of the quality of our nursing program and, and what a great job they do. Um, today, Dr. McLeod and I attended the 22nd annual Kansas All-State Academic Team Luncheon, and we had two recipients there. Two of our students uh, represented our college. One was Stephen Brewer, um, who's carrying a GPA of 3.67, He's majoring in public administration, What's, um, and just an incredible student um, who also works full time for the city of Olathe in fleet coordination. And it was really impressive when he was explaining to us what he did. Um, it was fantastic, and in fact, it was fantastic. He's undecided about where he's going to go. He's definitely gonna go for a master's uh, in, in public administration down the road. And then Catalina Wedman, she has a GPA of 3.82 majoring in Hispanic studies and human rights. Um, she is also undecided. Uh, what incredible representatives we had for our school there today uh, to receive their, their awards. Um, and a special shout out to Anna Page and her team who've done such a great job with our Phi Theta Kappa program. Um, our chair would be happy to know that in um, getting commitments from this group of all these, every school and every campus had two award winners, that uh, KSU humbled their uh, main in-state rival 13 to five. So congratulations to, uh, to K-State. Um, Trustee Cook will talk about the legislative summit. Um, Donnie did a great job lobbying everyone there. Um, I, I have to tell you that it's great to take a student there, and we've been doing that for a couple years, and they get to see exactly how our government works, or maybe perhaps how it, how it doesn't work, but the staffs in those, in those offices are absolutely fantastic and uh, they treat us with incredible respect. Hats off to Dick Carter for always setting that, that up. Um, it's just another example of one of the many opportunities we have here for student success. And I think um, that we should all be proud that those types of opportunities happen every day for, for all of our students here at Johnson County Community College. So that wraps up my report, thank you. Great report. Trustee Lindstrom. Question, uh, President Subject, on the uh on the uh, enrollment figures, mm -hmm. how, how different would, would it look, in, and I guess I could do the math, but I don't have it in front of me, how different would it look if we did not do the, if we didn't see the growth in uh, the metro? We'd be down. We'd be down, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you. It was a good move. It was a good move for us. And the metro rate, rate was a special midpoint tuition rate between out of state and in-state that we allowed for certain zip codes within the Kansas City metropolitan area. So that's, that's what we refer to when we talk about the metro rate. Yeah, it was a, you know, we told them that we were gonna launch the metro rate and um, a part of the deal was we got Mr. McLeod too, or Dr. McLeod. So it worked out really well um, for Johnson County Community College. So thanks, Mickey. He's given us all kinds of special intel uh, on this. <laughs> we were in all kinds of negotiations, weren't we? Yeah. Uh, before that actually well, happened. Backdoor dealings. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> There's a player to be named later too. I, I, yeah, there yeah. is. <laughs> Jim later will be here. Uh, okay, Trustee Cross, you had a question? Yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. M Mr. President, we have a number of different things we do internationally. Looks like, as I know, and you know, with Pakistan and Germany in Heidelberg, I believe. But my main question is, uh, we have six, six students who are going to Northwestern Polytechnical University 
and I, I botched this name, Xian? Xian. Xian. How do we establish that relationship in the middle of northwest China? That has been around for some time, and I'm not sure of the history. I apologize for just becoming aware of it. No, th that relationship um, actually is one that we inherited, and Tom has been shepherding um, for quite some time. It, it started um, with some folks from Johnson County's faculty being interested in human rights in, in China and then working with some of their colleagues <coughs> down through the years. We've had um, both a robust uh, number of students that transfer our agreement actually is that they provide um, a set number of spaces. We have um, 28 spaces that we can fill if students are qualified. They guarantee that they provide housing for those students uh, and allow them to study there um, for the semester. We routinely have about 13 um, students every semester that go. Um, this semester is, is a, a few um, different, but we, because we had some folks who wanted to stay, and we kind of said, no, you gotta come home and give some other folks the opportunity to actually go travel. So. Just a brief follow-up. Approximately, how many international students do we have on campus? Oh man, right now about 13, a little over 1,300, close to 1,400 international students. It's a substantial percentage of our total student body. About eight. And they all pay a higher tuition and fee they and do. grade? Um, a little more than double. Mm -hmm. 220. Mm -hmm. And we don't even really market that. I mean, a lot of that's word of mouth and some of the relationships that we have. A couple of years ago, I had the, the privilege of joining Dr. Brian Wright to model UN. Uh, Kind of national competition in, in New York City, and um, we also we shared that competition um, with a group from Xi'an. So 17 Chinese students working side by side with our students. It was really a, an incredible experience, and you should have seen our students um, and, and Dr. Wright work with these with, with the Chinese students, getting them to be really strong participants in the whole in the whole process. So it was a great a great experience for for all parties involved. Yeah, that's every year. Um, we're right now finding host families for those students to come this year. Thank you. Other questions? Dr. McLeod, I, I don't know how you've learned all that detail <laughs> so fast. We don't either. But, <laughs> but I tell you, I'm impressed. I read a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, no, you must. You went to Iowa State. <laughs> we, were, we, were up, we were in Topeka today, and, and like everybody there knows Dr. McLeod already. It's really kind of, it's, 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 it's terrific. I'm impressed. All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is old business, and typically we don't have any old business, but I'm going to uh, read some things today that I think are important uh, for the board uh, to communicate to the public and to the campus community. Um, as, as Dick Carter indicated earlier, there were hearings uh, a week and a half ago in both the House and the Senate on bills that would have extended the exemption for higher education to allow us to not, not permit concealed carry on campus. Uh, w in other words, we could continue to control our own destiny. Um, and uh, Melanie Harvey uh, testified and presented testimony at both of those. Uh, I felt it was important that we do something on behalf of the community college as well from the trustees. Uh, this is a, an historical position that the college trustees have taken. In 2012, when the concealed carry bill was passed, that gave a four-year window for colleges not to allow it um, that will expire this July 1, absent a change in legislation. Melody Rail was the chair of our Board of Trustees, and Melody went to Topeka and testified. Melody is an Army veteran. She is a law enforcement officer uh, veteran. She taught at the police academy at Johnson County Community College, and she was a member of the Board of Trustees. There couldn't have been anybody more qualified to testify about safety and security issues, um, uh, the issues of weapons in various uh, communities and uh, settings. Um, her, her position at that time was that this is a local control issue and it ought to be left up to the Board of Trustees of various community colleges or the Board of Regents for the Regents Universities. Um, so I, I think it's helpful that I, I'm gonna simply gonna read the, the memorandum that, we, that I submitted on behalf, I, I guess on behalf of myself and the Board based on our uh, historical position. Uh, in 1965, the Kansas legislature established the Kansas State System of Community Junior Colleges. 
The legislation enabled the locally created system of community colleges that serve our community so well today. The fundamental basis for the Kansas Community College system was its insistence that locally elected trustees serve as the overseers of policy and practice for their respective colleges. Johnson County Community College, through its elected trustees, has consistently supported and advocated for local control inherent in the community college system. Our college operates because of the support of Johnson County taxpayers who provide 61% of our revenues and our students who provide 22% of our revenues through tuition. Most importantly, Johnson County residents elect our seven college trustees who oversee the college. We believe our trustees who serve at the will of the people are best suited to determine policy affecting the college. House Bill number 2353 passed in 2012 provided college campuses with an exemption from changes in Kansas concealed carry law until July 1, 2017. Since then, our college has worked hard to determine the best ways to provide the safest environment possible within the law. This effort contributed to where we are today. We have fully armed, a fully armed professional police department with 37 employees, including 23 sworn officers who carry weapons and have full arrest powers. The remaining 14 employees are trained civilians who serve their roles of dispatcher, emergency preparedness, and other support functions. The total annual cost for this police department is $3.3 million. Throughout our campus, we have 462 cameras monitoring activity in our parking hot lots, grounds, and hallways. We have conducted 117 ALICE training sessions, alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. This training empowers faculty, staff, and students to provide the best response to a violent intruder. We commissioned the Docking Institute of Public Affairs at Fort Hayes State University to survey our staff and students regarding their position on allowing guns on campus. JCC faculty commissioned the same organization to survey the faculty. The results are as follows. 81% of faculty and staff wish to eliminate guns on campus or extend the current exemption. 16% indicated a desire to have guns on campus. 65% of students wish to eliminate guns on campus or extend the current exemption. 35% indicated a desire to have guns on campus. We are ever vigilant in our efforts to help ensure the safety of our campus. Our behavioral intervention team and our Keeping Our People Safe or COPS program are proactive approaches to provide early alerts regarding safety concerns. We continually reinforce, quote, if you see something, say something, unquote. In summary, we have not wavered from our position provided in testimony in 2012 by former trustee chair Melody Rail. It is our position that the issue of whether individuals should be permitted to carry concealed firearms in campus buildings should be decided by the locally elected officials who have been entrusted to make such decisions by the citizens we serve. Thank you for considering our statement. That was submitted by both to both the Senate and the House <coughs> committees. Uh, the, the second thing I wanted to note was that we have presented at two of the trustee meetings, uh, and I believe by consensus, uh, agreed to a system of statement of principles on our legislative positions generally, which, the, which my memorandum on the concealed carry legislation followed. Uh, our state principles for state actions include supporting the authority of the locally elected JCCC trustees to determine policies and procedures in the best interest of the college and its stakeholders, to oppose higher education policy provisions that undermine local control of funding, thereby eroding an institution's connection between its stakeholders and the needs of the local community, oppose higher education policy provisions that undermine local control to make decisions related to the safety and protection of our campus community. To support strategic higher education partnerships with entities such as the Kansas Board of Regents that strengthen accountability and outcomes for students. To support sufficient state fundings to meet the objectives of Senate Bill 345, which brought community colleges under the supervision and coordination of the Kansas Board of Regents effective July 1999. To support continued funding of career and technical education initiatives such as Senate Bill 155, enacted in May 2012, with, which authorizes Johnson County Community College to waive the cost of tuition for high school students 
who meet the who meet Kansas residency requirements for enrollment in tiered career educational career technical courses to support fiscally sound policies that strengthen and protect the Kansas public employee retirement system to promote the recruitment and retention of employees we support the continuation and enforcement of designated geographic community college service areas to meet the educational needs of the state in an efficient manner for taxpayers and we support access to higher education for everyone in our community to prepare all students to meet the increasing global demands of our economy on the federal side our principles are to support federal programs that enhance the access quality accountability and outcomes of higher education all of those are somewhat general in nature but establish a principle and a framework for us to make decisions on individual items that may come before either the Kansas legislature or the Congress. So uh, I believe it was important to relate those today as part of the old business. I uh, believe they have been uh, endorsed by this board. And uh, unless there are other comments, we, we will move on to the liaison reports. Thank you. I, I think the campus community uh, should know those state statements on behalf of the board. Just generally, if I may, Mr. Trustee Chairman. Cross. Uh, Trustee Ingram, I think, mentioned earlier what, what Trustee Sharp would always say, and it is to reach out to your elected officials. I think now more than ever they need to hear from you, uh, and I think there's certainly grounds for compromise. Uh, Representative uh, Louise, who I know in the state legislature from Kansas City, Kansas, had mentioned that maybe home rule could be one option where, like, on a county-by-county -county basis, <coughs> perhaps in counties where they need <coughs> or may need this law uh, and, and where we spend uh, quite a bit of money here at a college or in a community on, on local police, we may not want this rule. So I think uh, reasonable minds can disagree. I think you said it very eloquently and I appreciate your comments and leadership on this issue. Uh, but I think now more than ever, I think is the time that you need to reach out to your elected officials and let them know what you think. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to our liaisons, and the first one will be from the Faculty Association President, Dr. Arjo. The president's already bragged you up, so this is some pressure here. Okay, we'll see what I can do. Uh, thank you, as always, for the chance to uh, address the board. Um, I have a couple of things tonight. Uh, one, just picking up right where uh, Trustee uh, Musa left off. Um, so recall at the last meeting I presented a statement on behalf of the uh, FA in support of legislation that would extend the exemption to the concealed uh, carry laws. Uh, that did make its way into the written testimony to the House and Senate bills. And you've heard Melanie gave oral testimony. Uh, the two of us were supposed to give oral testimony at the Senate hearing, but something went amiss. Uh, but as we just heard, we were um, joined in this by um, Trustee Musel on behalf of the board. And at our last meeting, uh, the FA meeting, I was not there, I was sick. But in my absence, um, I was asked to uh, present a statement uh, professing our appreciation for that. So I would like to do that uh, now. So on behalf of the Johnson County Community College Faculty Association, I would like to express our appreciation to Chair Greg Musel and to the Board of Trustees for the written testimony that was submitted in support of HB 2074 and SB 53. While we acknowledge the presence of dissenting opinion in the JCCC community regarding having guns on campus, we agree strongly with the sentiments expressed in support of keeping policies and practices regarding campus safety within the purview of the college. The FA intends to continue to press for an extension to the current uh, exemptions, and we are thankful for the support of the board and administration. So I'll also add my personal thanks for that statement. It's always nice to be on the same side. Huh? It is. <laughs> we do appreciate that. All right, and real quick, I want to take advantage of my opportunity here to um, invite the board and the administration and the JCCC community to an event I've been helping organize um, in conjunction with Anna Page and Honors as part of their International Week. Uh, so on Monday night, we're going to be screening a film called Gandhi's Gift, which is a documentary covering the last year of the Mahatma Gandhi's uh, life. Uh, this was a difficult time for him. He was dealing not only with the final stages of the push for independence from Great Britain, but also with growing sectarian divide within India between Hindus and Muslims, a matter that caused him a great bit of anguish. Um, so after the screening, which will be at 7 o'clock in the Hudson, we're going to have a panel discussion with one of the film produ uh, film's producers, along with uh, three faculty members. So this will be Professor Stephanie Sabato from Graphic Design, 
uh, Professor Samir Hussein from Business and my colleague in philosophy, Professor Don Gale. So we'll have a discussion about the film and some of the issues uh, that it raise, uh, raises. So there's a reception at 6th, 3rd in the atrium. I'd just like to invite everybody who might find this interesting. I think it's going to be a very uh, inspiring evening and a very timely message. So thank you. Thank you. I, I think that we're not quite done, so we can't tie a ribbon around it, but the, the international and multicultural um, theme of this event, of this meeting, will continue then through Monday evening through that presentation. So, questions for Dr. Arjo? No? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Glad you're feeling better, too. Yes. Uh, next report would be Johnson County Education Research Triangle, Trustee Lindstrom. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a brief uh, report. Um, receipts for January were $1,423,569.79. This amount reflects a approximately $9,000 increase over last year. Last year's sales receipts, uh, sales tax receipts in Johnson County were up around 3%. Um, we, uh, we, our last meeting was on January 23rd at the KU Edwards campus. Uh, predominantly, our business at that meeting was transitioning our membership. We lost four members uh, at that meeting. Uh, Lenexa Mayor Mike Bame uh, retired off the board uh, after being or serving there for eight years. Uh, Johnson County Chair Chairman Ed Eilert. Uh, went off the board. Senator Kay Wolf and Senator Jeff Melcher all stepped down from the board. Uh, those members were replaced. All but one were replaced. Um, Leewood Mayor Peggy Dunn, uh, Olathe Mayor uh, Mike Copeland, and uh, State Representative Melissa Rooker uh, were their replacements. <coughs> there is one uh, vacancy that uh, we're working with the governor's office trying to get them to make an appointment there. Uh, and uh, we also voted for officers for JSERT, and those officers are, uh, Carl Gerlach will now be the chair, Peggy Dunn will be the vice chair, and Jason Osterhaus will serve as treasurer. Uh, and uh, the next meeting is Monday, April 10th, uh, at 7.30 a.m. at K-State Olathe campus. And again, I would encourage everyone, if they want more information about uh, the JCERT uh, efforts, to go on jocotriangle.com. That concludes my report. Thank you, David. Questions? Not, we're ready for the Kansas Association of Community College Trustee Report. Dr. Cook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The committee met today. I did not attend because of my ear problem. Uh, but it was part of the uh, Fight of Fate Capital Luncheon that Dr. Sobchik mentioned earlier. Uh, but I will take the, uh, and our next meeting for KACCT is June 9th and 10th in Colby uh, Community College, so maybe we could walk across Kansas and get to that meeting in time. Uh, I, I would like to take a moment, though, to talk a little bit more about the uh, ACCT meeting that was held, uh, was really the sponsor for the National Legislative Summit. And uh, we had uh, meetings on Saturday, full board meeting on Sunday, committee meetings, uh, actually committee meetings on Sunday, board meeting Monday morning. And I think it's important uh, to understand that ACCT has a real clear mission about being the chief advocate for community colleges across the country. And I think it's also important to understand that their uh, six core values deal with boardsmanship, advocacy, student success, diversity, innovation, and service to community. And as we talk about a board uh, regarding those six core values, we always challenge ourselves uh, to benchmark against our own college as to how are we doing, how are we developing boardsmanship within our college? Uh, are, we, are we really serious about student success and, and how do we measure whether students are succeeding or not? And so uh, I think it's always refreshing to know <coughs> Uh, kind of where we are uh, in comparison to other colleges. And again, I'm just very pleased to be able to represent this college uh, when we talk about those six core values. We, uh, we uh, presented a platform to our senators and congressmen, as we've already discussed. I won't go into that. But among those major initiatives that ACCT is advocating for is the renewal of the Pell Grant. Uh, many of you, at least on campus, that deal with the Pell Grant know that in 2012 that program was cut. 
There used to be 18 semesters of eligibility. That was reduced to 12. Our initiative this year is to go back to 14 semesters and continue with the year-round Pell Grant distribution. Uh, I think we know pretty clearly that the research indicates that when a student um, aborts their program, doesn't go to summer school, drops a semester, the likelihood of completing that certificate or degree, degree is, is diminished. And so uh, I'm pleased to say that I believe our two senators and our congressmen are very supportive of the Pell Grant, and we expect that uh, we'll, get that, we'll get that reauthorized. We also uh, are pushing the reauthorization of the higher ed bill, uh, the Perkins Act. Uh, we have a uh, piece in there for infrastructure, and not just not just uh, roads and bridges and highways and buildings, but we had a considerable discussion about data links becoming a part of our infrastructure uh, to the point where if uh, a student is at College A on the East Coast and decides to move to College B on the West Coast, it seems with technology we should have the data uh, resources available that those credits would be transferred seamlessly and that student wouldn't lose the work that they had done in one part of a country and moving to another part of the country. Uh, we also uh, have a program uh, for DACA students, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the students who um, may have immigration issues and how we can help them continue with their program. So uh, I'm just pleased that uh, the national organization is very committed to the advocacy of, of the Community College Network. I, I've lost it here, but let me pull it up again. This morning, uh, Secretary DeVos addressed our, our, our conference. I was not there as I came back yesterday to try to be at meetings here today. And as you, as you read the media, we, we all probably have a feeling about the Secretary of Education. And we've seen in the media where she hasn't been <clears throat> welcomed very well, at least by K through 12. Uh, but this was her first public speech this morning to a national organization of ACCT. And I just want to share one part of, of her speech uh, because I think it's a, a real tribute to the hard work we at least do on this campus. And I'm just taking a, a, a paragraph out of context of her total speech. She says this, community colleges are a uniquely American education asset. They are nimble, they are, she says you, you are nimble, you are entrepreneurial, you provide important and valued pathways for students to prepare for success in our competitive economy. You equip students for high demand fields and skilled jobs that help grow local economies and maintain community. And you're absolutely essential engines of workforce and economic development locally and regionally. Another, another one of our key pieces I forgot was this whole notion about workforce development. And what's exciting I believe about that is that appears to be a strong bipartisan issue. Whether you're Democrat or Republican, I believe our elected officials understand that in, within their communities and within their states, the community college is the best position agency to help grow economic uh, development and uh, develop uh, uh, career paths for people uh, to meet the employment needs of their respective communities. And uh, there are other issues that are going to be seriously partisan, but, but we think our community college uh, platform and uh, what we mean to economic growth is, is going to receive strong bipartisan support. So I was encouraged by Secretary DeVos's remarks, even though uh, uh, the jury is really uh, young on uh, what her success will be, particularly, as I say, in K through 12. Um, I, I think aside from that, I, I'm just really pleased to represent this college at ACCT. Uh, as Dr. Sopcich and I were, um, were standing in line for the cabs, we, we visited with uh, a president uh, of, of uh, well, the Jersey City, Hudson Community College in Jersey City, New Jersey, and their president used to work on this campus, and his, his trustee is the president of ACCT, Bakari Lee, and uh, two presidents ago, another former employee here, uh, is president of that Michigan college, uh, and uh, Robin Smith from Michigan was the president of ACCT. So uh, I guess what's really exciting is the, the roots go deep uh, of Johnson County Community College, not only within this community and state, but across the country. And um, so I'm, I'm pleased to represent our college in that regard. That concludes my report. Thank you, Jerry. We're pleased that you take the time and effort to do that as well. Uh, questions? 
for Trustee Cook. If not, we'll move on to the foundation liaison report from Trustee Ingram. Yes, and I do not have a report this evening for you. We meet again on March the 7th. Okay. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda is a portion of the agenda each month which uh, contains routine matters that have been reviewed uh, by staff and by other committees. Uh, they are typically considered in one, one motion and one vote. Any member of the board may pull an item to be considered separately and debated and voted on separately. Are there any other members of the, any items on the consent agenda that anybody would like to have considered separately this evening? If not, I would accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. So move. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? If not, all in favor say yes. Yes. Okay. All opposed, no. The consent agenda passes six to zero. Um, at this point, I would like to uh, request a motion to go into executive session for two separate purposes, and I'll outline each of those separately and ask for one motion. The first executive session would last for no more than 45 minutes. Um, it would be a motion to go into executive session to discuss uh, for discussions concerning security and safety matters on campus. Uh, we, we would like to invite to that 45-minute executive session Joe Sopchik, Terry Schleesch, Judy Korb, Mickey McLeod, Barbara Larson, Tanya Wilson, Chris Gray, Greg Russell, and Elisa Pacer uh, for the purposes of that session, which would last, again, no more than 45 minutes. After that, we would immediately move into an executive session for the discussion of personnel matters of non-elected personnel in order to protect the privacy interests of the individuals to be discussed. That session would last no more than 15 minutes. So thus, the executive session would last no more than 60 minutes. We would reconvene in this room. Uh, no action would be taken in either executive session. For the second session, we would like to invite President Sopcich and General Counsel Tanya Wilson. Is there such a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded to move into those executive sessions not to exceed 60 minutes. And for those limited purposes, uh, all in favor say yes. 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 Those yes. no. That motion passes. We will start the executive session at 10 till 7 on Bef this clock. Before Question. you adjourn to executive session, could I ask either Dr. Larson or, or Dr. Weber to possibly comment on um, last night's athletic academic uh, presentation? Oh, Does absolutely. Does anyone feel, feel comfortable in doing that? It was it was great. It was amazing to see all of our athletes represented and and look at their GPAs in the program. And then at the end, um, our director Carl Heinrich asked those students among many that were lined along the gym, those who had a 4.0 to come to the center of the court. And gosh, there must have been yeah 20 more of those students. They were enthusiastic. They were bright, and um, it was. It was a great, uh, a great ceremony. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up because that's always an impressive event. Our, our student athletes are students. Yes. They're not just athletes. Uh, Dr. Weber, do you have something to add to that? Okay. Okay. Well, why don't we? Do we need to ten till soon enough? That gives us about three minutes if we need a break. All right. We'll start the executive session at ten till seven. We'll reconvene here no later than ten till eight. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> You're all welcome to stay. We have reconvened in open session. Uh, we, can, we finished our executive session at 7.50. It's now 7.52 by the time we got back on camera. Uh, no action was taken on either of the executive uh, session items. And uh, we are ready for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor say yes. Aye. Opposed no. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for hanging around. <laughs>